Welcome, everyone, to the second, third lecture of the semester. It's really a great pleasure to have Christina Diaz Moreno and Efren Garcia Grinda this evening with us. They are partners of Amitero Nueve. This is the last time I say it in Spanish. But <laughs> the partnership started in 1997 as Tero Nueve, an open structure located in Madrid designed to bridge professional practice, research, and teaching inside an architectural frame. And in 2003, they changed the name to become Amit Tero Nueve. As the name of their practice suggests, Amit Tero Nueve, or in between Tero Nine, has developed a unique and exciting body of work dedicated to an architectural practice set between scholarship and building and between building and design research, something we certainly value here at the school. The practice is committed to reinventing nature beyond the false dichotomy that opposes what is natural to what is conceived as artificial and instead seeks to construct another nature, a polluted, altered nature that is at once nature and fantasy, architecture and environment. Their work moves beyond any distinction between high culture and pop. For Amit 09, everything, or maybe nothing, is pop, whereby fixed meanings are now replaced by a network of links and of multiple origins, and in which meanings and symbols, drawings, objects are entirely recast. To define those intermediary spaces, Amit 09 has coined the term third spaces. Third spaces are like gardens. They're understood to construct new relationships between nature, technology, and history. There are spaces defined as mediating between different materials of different origins. There are also buildings that are now understood as an assembly of complex ecologies that act as a linking mechanism between living beings, social groups, and technological objects. Third spaces can also be understood as cities, which are no longer mere stages for our activities, but an integral part of our scope of action as architects and designers, in which urban form moves away from the classic idea of the complete or ideal city to one which engages with essential urban phenomena and which conflict is imagined to be able to be designed. Third spaces can also be thought of as public spaces transformed from voids to become a real context for social interaction and where the active involvement with social exchange becomes the main purpose of a project for new architecture of the city. In this moment where we are caught in sort of politics of identity and boundary and definition, I think it's so inspiring uh, to look at this way of thinking, of blurring and of redesigning as really part of the kind of agency of the architects. And I'm really excited to have them to share with us their exquisite drawings and buildings and representations and it's not clear what is what and the two sort of converge um, to inspire kind of new ways of thinking and of engaging um, with the world. Their work is part of the permanent collection of the Pompidou Center in Paris, has been exhibited in multiple biennales, Venice, Sharjah, uh, uh, amongst other, they are currently teaching at Princeton. They've lectured and taught in many um, schools uh, across Europe, Asia, and also the US. And their projects and writings of the last 15 years uh, were, recent, were published in 2014 uh, in a monograph uh, called Third Natures. Uh, 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 and more interestingly and recently, they were um, published in Al Croquis together with Moss and kind of absolutely beautiful uh, and very inspiring um, kish issue um, of their work. So please join me tonight in welcoming Cristina Diaz Moreno and Efren Garcia Grinda. Okay, well, thank you very much for an uh, amazing introduction. Thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, all of you coming here today, having in mind that some of you have a submission in today's. That's a lot. We really appreciate it. And um, well, it's, it, for us, it's a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure. It's not the first time. And, and we love the place. We love the, the house. And we are now trying to connect this guy to show our slides. Yes, he's here. So. Uh, 
um, let me start with uh, the beginning, that is the name of the lecture, that is uh, Alternative Notions of Beauty. And it's going to be a lecture partially uh, about time, also about notions of beauty, our own understanding, and how time is compressed in architecture and how things happen in parallel to connect back our discipline with other subjects, individuals, and other species. We will talk about all of this. But also the lecture will be about the design as a form of knowledge, or how we understand it. We are obsessed. Uh, we are two obsessed guys, in fact. So we are obsessed with both the consciousness and the connection with the world around uh, of every practical, formal, and technological design decision when we are working as an alternative to the banality that has dominated the discourse and practice of architecture, like, you know, the world around. And today we are going to talk about birds, people, cosmologies, and gardens, about discoveries, engineering, structural behavior, and also about hedonism, vision, strabismus, third natures, third natures again, and of course about amit, so about the space in between, uh, or surrounded by, or connected with things. Um, so this this is strange. <coughs> sorry, this is strange. Can you hear me? Probably. Yeah. Okay. This is strange uh, relationship with time that Christina was referring about. It all started when uh, researching a, a term that we were using at that time in certain articles, we found this guy, that is on the screen, a uh, really old one, uh, that in, um, in, um, uh, in a letter of um, a fellow uh, humanist, uh, Plimio Tomacello in 1541, described the series of Renaissance gardens he had the opportunity to visit, to experience, I would say, around the, the Garda Lake in the, in the north Italy uh, at that time. And he wrote uh, this, this, uh, this statement, right? So for the gardens, for the Renaissance gardens, uh, that he found a, a new maturity was not quite known at that time, that he needed to somehow invent a new term for that, for that thing that he was experiencing, you know, thoroughly which was like this word, third natures. But let's start um, talking about why you know, we, we decided, we were very much into the contemporary world at that time, uh, why we decided to, to, to take such an archaism and to convert it into one of the main words in, in our practice. This is going to be a very personal uh, lecture, maybe. But uh, we are talking about time uh, in relationship with projects, so how long and short period projects uh, can live together and have an influence among them. I'm sure that all of you have experienced or will experience this. In 2004, we won a competition uh, this, uh, for this uh, institution Libre de Enseñanza, that translation could be free institution for education, that, well, we won in that moment and it was finished after more than 10 years. Uh, it was finished in 2014, 2015. 15. And due to a confidentiality contract that we have with uh, the client, we couldn't even show what we were doing. But at the same time, we were teaching in different uh, universities and, uh, and institutions. We were doing other competitions, and we were publishing uh, our ideas that were in parallel with this guy. And as I said, all our projects try to refer deeply to the world around and are uh, composed not, not just by a single self-standing object or, or building, but they are understood as a complex set, we understand them as a complex set of connections with many other entities and things, without discriminating them in relation with the historical moment, uh, if they are existing or they existed in the past, but in a sort of incremental non-nostalgic non non-nostalgic time, nostalgic is the key word. And having this in mind, today we are, and this is the final part of the introduction, today we are going to talk about one project, this guy. And we are going to explain how it is understood for us as a small cosmology and how it has been linked and fed by encounters with texts, thoughts, and buildings in a time frame of 12 years, more or less. We will be visiting the building. We will be entering in and out. But just briefly, because maybe this is very Spanish and you don't know the, the, the local 
uh, well, you don't know about the Institución Libre de Enseñanza, very short, I will introduce it. It was set up in 1876 as a constantly evolving experimental laboratory for new teaching methods, led by a group of university professors, among them in the middle uh, is Giner de los Ríos, who were previously sanctioned by and suspended from the university for pleading for academic freedom. Academic freedom, that's amazing, seeing from now. And all of them were convinced of the necessity of the deep reform of the society through the education of children, so starting from the beginning. They created not only the institution itself, but also fostered the most important cultural and scientific centers of the country, in which people like Federico García Lorca, Salvador Dalí, Juan Ramón Jiménez, Luis Buñuel, Antonio Machado, and several Spanish Nobel Prizes were involved, as well as the so-called Generation of 98 that was educated in the garden and the pavilions of the former institution. Maybe, maybe the most important and brilliant generation of Spanish culture since the 16th century and almost the last one before the Spanish Civil War. The historical place was taken by the dictator troops during the Civil War in the year 1939. And this is a key point because from that moment till almost the last part of the 20th century, it was gone. They burned the library and the archive, and also they totally destroyed the, the garden, sorry. So after that, the headquarters were donated to a religious institution, and most of the, of the people involved, in, or the descendants, were forced to go into exile. Well, it's a short, super short introduction, but it's for you to know what kind of institution we are going to talk about. Only after resuming democracy, uh, the disciples and descendants recover the site. Then, this, well, you can see this is the original location here. Well, where is it? Up there. Yep. Please. In the original location, here. that is very close to uh, the south-north axis of the city, that is La Castellana. Then, just to finish this short intro about the institution, the working material was very difficult for us because there's no information, no files, there's no, on, it's only a, the memory of a common identity, a culture, or a, a common feeling of, and thinking. So how to deal with this and how to, tr to translate into architecture and how to do it without a nostalgic approach, that was the most important question. Um, but let us uh, um, start by saying that the notion of a space closer, Okay, thank you. Um, that the uh, somehow a renewed notion of a space is a crucial uh, thing or aspect for us in the world where, that we were developing that time and we are still developing. Um, a space for us could be defined as a complex interwoven network of interrelationship among many different agents. A complex place where an immense amount of interactions between different agents are overlapped. Uh, for us, it's a gigantic link, a library of links, an immense register of interrelations between different agents. By saying this, we mean that uh, we are like used to, to think about the space as, as emptiness and, we are, and, and how to deal with the creation of the adjectivation of this emptiness. And we are very much into considering instead the a space of interaction as the, as, as the uh, notion of a space that interests us. So I would say that instead of uh, having a, a pure passive concept of reception, which is uh, meant to be in this emptiness, something that you're receiving through your senses, a space is presented then, in, in, in our view, as a, as a space of intermediation where you are at the same time, you know, uh, experiencing and, 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 and creating it, obviously. You are being a part of a situation uh, that is under permanent construction as a changing set of interrelations with other biotic and non-biotic entities. You know, you can see, that you can see in the images. Um, the funny th or the interesting thing for us is that through the work of with this institution that Cristina was referring to and his uh, its founder, Gerardo de los Rios, we we somehow realized that the, instead of being related with a physic the physical traces context, this you know, word that is uh, constantly used in architectural discipline could be more related with a group of people, simply. With a, a, a group of people that is having a common identity and is having a common culture with its material culture, 
with its symbology, with its aesthetical expressions as well, uh, so that architect could be referring to that expanded notion of context instead of being referring to the physical traces that we can find in the cities, which is the usual notion of context. And that um, suddenly blasted in our mind because architecture has had, as a discipline, very serious problems dealing with ourselves, humans, and how to integrate ourselves uh, in the discipline. How, how are we considering us subjects as part of, of, of the process of designing a, a building? So you have only to think about the, name, the names that we are giving to ourselves in relationship with the architectural practice, you know, starting from the ones borrowed from philosophy and from soci sociology, people, labor force, audience, citizens, public, multitude, and so on, but also the ones that are, big, uh, that are like from within this, the, the, the discipline, such as user or client, such a, a generic characterization of, of, the, of, the, of the subjects that are involved in the creation and the definition of a space, it wasn't, it wasn't enough for us, basically. So, well, simultaneously, as uh, the lecture is going to be touching projects maybe well-known or not well-known, but uh, published at the same time, simultaneously to the development of the project, we were testing in the office other projects dealing with these questions for ourselves as an intellectual ground zero for, uh, to face similar topics. Um, in this one, we were trying to relate in a specific intentional community with architectural decisions, and the experiment was placed in, uh, in Salt Lake City. We explored if a big public space could be an activator of an intentional community as a counter city, like a Salvation, Salvation Mountain or Drop City, Biosphere 2, or a Slav City. And this public space is an enclave uh, containing a series of micro buildings dedicated to all kinds of gathering and public activities consorted a long time with a simple technique of inflation. It is a set of excessive and carnal forms generated inflating large silicon membranes whose shape is defined by limiting their movements in lines and points on their surface. But more than explaining the project, what is important for us is that we are extremely interested in the contemporary and alternative forms of life or lifestyles as one of the most intense and genuine products of our culture, we truly believe that they constitute at the same time a record and a critique of the society and are real attempts to build an alternative to the codes, customs and dominant material worlds. Based on an affiliation and affection, they are in fact mini societies proposed in direct confrontation with the mainstream society while cultivating these sensors many times through alternative aesthetics that represents a symbolic way of expression and negotiation of identity. Through, through projects like this one and our work in the academia, mainly uh, at the architectural associations uh, during the last decade, during the last 10 years, we have been speculating about how to translate into formal material and, orga and organizational decisions the behaviors, the material worlds, and the symbolic expressions of those, those micro communities without resulting in a direct or straightforward linguistic appropriation. As in this case, where we took the opportunity of participating in the Greek pavilion for the Venice Biennale to, uh, as an invitation, uh, we developed a project called Aegean Paradise through thought as an alternative model to the mass tourism in the Mediterranean coast. Is a vast and, and light silk surface that shelters an ocean of perfect weather underneath that is simultaneously infinite. And is, the idea is to propose a big communal house that shelters an augmented landscape confined between veils, threads, and, and curtains, and where privacy is achieved by distance and proportions. The few constructions within it are repeated systematically, generating an, an infinite and after, abstract field. This weird paradise uh, is thought for the other part of the life, the counter routine, uh, temporary compensation to the everyday gray reality. And we explore in this project the possibility of dealing with the, the holidays, the, the, this suspension of the time when simply certain ideals impossible to get on our everyday reality, gray 
reality and routine are temporarily uh, actualized and are made possible. The invention of alternative lifestyles is a, is a key understanding for us, can be considered then as a conscious and political act, discussing the dominant and hegemonic culture through everyday practices, reinventing alternative forms of being in the world that also permits us to review the idea of shared environments as in this image from a project for the canals of Brugge in Belgium. So coming back to the project that we'll be dealing with uh, during the whole lecture, we had a very interesting problem there. So how to um, con not, con how to make allusions in architecture without a directly um, uh, appropriating um, uh, linguistic uh, tropes from the, from the group. How to design an architecture that can maintain relationship with things out, uh, outside itself, outside the discipline, without falling into the free fall of assemblage of languages. How to deal with, um, how to recall these links without falling into the simplistic, almost populistic identification to the identity of a community. Because they, these people were like pretty, pretty special to that in that moment in space. They were called the secular monks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and how to do it, as Christina was saying, without a, a nostalgic recall. And this, in this case, because we were dealing with something that was totally historic, be, be, uh, belonging to the history of, of, of a particular city. And surprisingly, we found a, a possible answer in Ginard de los Rios himself and his understanding of the landscape. Uh, that was a completely modern and almost a proto-ecological uh, one. We were like lucky in that, to that respect. That considered the landscape a cultural construct, uh, meaning that landscape and culture have a reciprocal and bionivocal bio influence. His approach was a mixture between a, a geographical understanding following the 19th century uh, theories uh, that started with Alexander von, Hul von Humboldt about geography, a pure experiential one, mainly approached uh, through excursions and walk throughout the landscape, nearby landscape of the city, that he described literally as the gaze, as the sight of movement throughout the landscape, as a sensible reception of, uh, of, of it through social wandering and scientific understanding. He was obsessed with this thing, which is the, the rock beauty of the Castilian landscape that through his eyes, maybe you can consider it poorly, there's nothing green on, on, on nature in the home during most of the time of the, along the year. Uh, through his eyes was mainly poor lands, yes, but golden lands of very na barren nature and intense beauty. It was somehow projecting a new way of looking at the, of those landscapes. But also, more interestingly for us, it, for Ginel de Lorios himself, the direct contact with things, but more specifically to those landscapes, was one of the most important pedagogical tools to, to really educate children, right? And, and as a moral kind of a also tool that could be at the end, you know, and really producing a completely renewal of the country. But also, we, uh, we are fortunate because uh, uh, because we la somehow we found that there was a, trans a physical translation of this idea of, of, of landscape within the uh, headquarters of the, of the foundation, the, the house that he was inhabiting and, and in where he was teaching the, those, those uh, disciples. Because uh, they were like thinking that uh, is in the garden, in the gardens themselves where proper education could be taking place. And that's a fantastical thing. The direct contact with things as a reproduction, as a small re scale reproduction of something that was happening out of, outside the city. So suddenly, we decided to, to invert, somehow to put upside down, you know, the targets of the project in the face of the competition. So we decided, somehow, that instead of being focused on the building, so in a totally uh, suicidal thing, we were like, we needed to be putting our efforts on the, on the garden itself. Instead of the building, the construction of the garden will be uh, the conceptual material center of the project. And the building is just what it gives shape to it, shape to it, stepping back and becoming just the background for it. So we selected a different, uh, is this moving? No, we, yeah. Okay, we selected different densities, locations, and rhythms for, of, of, for the different uh, vegetable species to foster uh, what the ecologists call an archive distribution of, of, 
of uh, the resources, you know, the water, air, the nutrients within the soil and so on. Everything is meant here to produce um, um, wildness, or if you want, the naturalness of the wild, based on the competition for the, these, those resources. So uh, instead of formally designing a garden, what we did basically was putting everything in there, the resources for the vegetable species to grow, and we foster a competition among them to produce and not an artificially produce a somehow ecosystem basing, you know, the species selected in those who Ginard uh, uh, de los Rios was encountering through his social wanderings. Sorry. So somehow it is a a a, a fragmented or a fragment, sorry, of an artificially constructed ecology. Uh, while, because it seems barely maintained, if you go there, you can have the opportunity to go there, you will see that there is uh, not certainly a formal logic to it, and, um, and it's not easy to understand how it is generated, but you see, you know, how these uh, different species are competing one another. As the Castilian Plateau for Hiner is not, it's not green except for a few weeks, but purple, coral, and silver, as you see in the image, uh, when we were like uh, somehow distributing the species in this geometric grid that is not anymore visible, right? Um, and somehow um, it's containing those uh, species and is recalling those landscapes that uh, Hiner and the Lorios was uh, um, um, somehow approaching as, um, as the main pedagogical tool for his disciples. The sequence of a wild naked garden of sprouts during the winter is slowly flowering in the spring and reaching a frugal, excessive, compacted and saturated material mass of greenery in the summer recalls the um, vegetable demographies of the, and dynamics of Hiner de los Rios landscapes. It seems clear now, maybe more for you, uh, why somehow we were so interested in this uh, notion of, of, of third natures and also why we were introducing uh, the understanding of other, other species in this set of interrelations that we were like calling third natures. Mm, so all other species from the people now to the other species and a big jump uh, to the past, so in 2002, uh, we started testing in different situations the role of environments and synthetic nature that could facilitate a direct and horizontal relationship among different species. This project is the Magic Mountain, an ecosystem mass for Ames Thermal Power Station in Iowa, where we propose to transform the existing building into a piece of landscape. We did a film for the Venice Biennale in that moment. This is a, the short film, he's working. Um, and the project was just a membrane of roses and, and a background of honeysuckle that, that was meant to attract uh, the most important butterfly and bird species in the, nor in the northern United States is in, the, in the paths of the, these species, transforming the building into a mountain where a variety of animals could live and attracted by the water tanks, of course, and by the insects and, and the, the whole ecosystem. We used in that moment, the, or we understood that a genetic material developed by a researcher born in, in Ames, uh, who grew many species adapted to the climate of, of Iowa, wo was the, the main tool for the designing of this project. And in this other one, we also explored this notion of architecture understood as a natural monument, artificially generated <coughs> and converted into a living system in the, uh, what uh, the name of the project is the National Museum of Energy, that is kind of difficult to get. Because the difficulty of creating this museum with the absence of an actual collection, they don't have a real collection, a collection of energy, that's not easy to get. The dismantling of the existing uh, buildings, the, the existing power plant, that are two huge buildings, empty and rough, and also the lack of clarity of the topic what is the Museum of Energy. So our decision was to um, base uh, the decisions, the design decisions, the, the, um, the geometry, the organization, the spatial organization, the, the materials, base them on the management of energy. And, and also the introduction of a complete ecosystem as part of the mechanisms to maximize the efficiency. So the air is like, uh, 
very like a normal way of using the air, but it's pre-treated in the existing underground galleries and the, in the old power station using the thermal inertia of the ground, and then is introduced in the beginner uh, space of the extension that becomes a vast vertical atrium with large indoor inverted domes that serve as big chimneys. Like a, it's a very normal way of doing this kind of um, manipulations. The inner space is a big room in between a climatic lobby and a new typology of greenhouse. It's a complete ecosystem with natural species from the Carboniferous period. And as I said, also participates actively in the treatment of the indoor climate and the energy control. So then we're coming back to this, to this, to this notion that uh, Bonfario introduced uh, in 1541, right? And that was like repeated many times uh, in some decades afterwards uh, by many, many uh, humanists. Uh, most of the of the of the uh, big writers, Shakespeare and Cervantes, were using this word sometimes. So you, you can imagine the impact of that thing into other thinkers, right? So, but he was using it uh, as as a, as a counterpoint of, of third nature, the one that is existing by itself, and, you know, the classical definition of nature, and second nature, which uh, from uh, Cicero was like used to be referring to artificial modification of nature, such as su such as a with practical reasons, such as agriculture. But the new Renaissance gardens, uh, um, that was a reality that was appearing in that moment specifically, not only had for Bonfario a new and non-expected material condition that were, that were like obviously something in between man-made and, and, and having natural uh, species, but also, and more importantly, they were culturally produced and received. Uh, remember that the references to classical uh, culture and mythology were uh, crucial in, the, in those gardens. But more importantly for us, uh, contesting the material, geometrical, and functional understanding in that moment of architecture as a necessary counterpart to discuss its own, the implications of, our, of architecture. Remember that in gardens, materials are alive and ever changing. You cannot control them totally. Geometry has to be happening in a different way than, rather than, than, than in architecture, so you cannot fixate it. And they're not necessarily determining the nature and the use of this space. And it, they're having a totally different purpose, which is somehow an hedonist approach to space. So these various things were like fundamental for us to understand that liberating architecture from a narrow-minded understanding of this relationship with human actions and activities is also a key point for us and could be leading for an architecture which is based on those notions of, of, of uh, introducing another, other different species, but also not having a close bionivical relationship with function and activities. Most of our projects rely on really a strong spatial organizations that are very resilient, that are really uh, powerful, and the relationship with activities are quite open, and it's something that happened as well in, in Ginar de los Rios Foundation. This openness and range of possibilities relations among spaces and activities is a, somehow achieved by those strong, clear spatial configurations. Then in most of our beloved examples of build, or of beloved buildings, are experiments on, on, on typologies. There are clashes between different moments and truly a, a typological inventions that appear in moments of crisis and uncertainty in terms of cult in, in, in cultural terms. Then coming back to Ginar de los Ríos, <coughs> in, in the case of the institution, the spatial configuration is based on the recreation of the historical headquarters configuration following as well the regulations that forced us to follow the existing massing to respect the, the rights of the surrounding buildings. So the proposal is a series of pavilions, classrooms and elevated, elevated pieces, like this is the Macpherson pavilion and is defined it, as it was defined by Giner de los Rios as surrounded by a belt of greenery, pursuing the ideal of the institution of approaching to the closest extent possible to outdoor life. And therefore, 
a series of pieces to be perceived as independent pavilions, but in fact connected uh, on their back, forming a super long and narrow building fold and, and wrapped around the garden itself. And all of them with angle and inclined sides, so, the, so they are perceived smaller than, than they are. The, therefore, the institution is based on the construction of, of, of a system of rooms around the garden. Internally, the rooms, the geometry, the different sizes, and, and the groupings permit different configurations of the space. And each room is a, it has no prevalent direction, and their relationship with the ever-changing garden and corridors is based on the different layers, the numerous layers surrounding them, from curtains to the lattice in a way that they are perceived as an extension of the garden. Seen from the interior, the lattice tends to disappear. A friend will explain a bit more about this. While from the exterior becomes an opaque lattice. It's a kind of background for the garden. The system of rooms is surrounded by a thick, specialized dividing wall, the black part. A hollow perimetral wall that shelters different spaces, staircases, elevators, and ancillary spaces that are wider or narrower, uh, and, and they con expand and con contract the public corridor. So it's like uh, having bigger and smaller spaces for informal meeting uh, spaces before the classroom and after the classroom, after the class. A similar notion related with the spatial organization was explored also in the, in the auditorium. It's a landscape of rooms situated just underneath uh, the central void at the end of the garden, below the ground level. You will see a picture after, uh, at the end of the lecture. And reproduces the set of, of rooms that you have seen before, inverting the way they are related. So the gradation between the interior and exterior of the classroom and the garden is translated with identical, identical shape and dimensions in a set of interconnected spaces, but changing completely the materiality. So that the different rooms look to the main stage through these large uh, cyclopean eyes. These rooms can be open or closed. These, these eyes can be open or closed to expand the, the auditorium. And, and the shape of the frames of these uh, strabismic openings uh, that look one another also act as bearing wings, I mean, structurally, they are working as, as beams that hold the metal columns of the upper uh, classrooms that appear in the, in the garden. So exploring the consequences of using exactly the same spatial uh, arrangement that is on top, but inverting the organization, playing with the way the rooms are interconnected. But after the competition, so we won the competition, we started to work with the client in, very, in a very long process. We were like uh, we were um, developing um, several projects at the same time. At, at that time, we were absolutely frustrated by the lack of working tools that uh, some of the uh, perceptual explorations we were trying to carry on um, uh, about were um, incapable somehow to to allow us to study those those uh, perceptual experiments we wanted to 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 to, to make in, in the in the building itself. So we began researching, and, and surprisingly, again, we were again very lucky. We found common ground with um, some scientific and an analytical representational systems that were used to study uh, the landscape uh, in the work of several authors that were very much, very influential, I would say, in the work of Gino de los Rios and his approach to, to the landscape. Particularly, we were interested in, 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 in a very important uh, name for geography, which is uh, Horace Benedict Saussure, um, that was trying to map the geography and the ge geological structures of the Alps. So he was the one that basically invented the alpinism, so this, this kind of uh, willingness of, of climbing you know, to, to the summits to discover the geography, the, the geography of this uh, impressive Im environment that, that were the Alps. In a series of expeditions uh, that he was undertaking around 1776, so Sir realized that a, a circular panorama could help to accurately and scientifically record not only the experience of, of, of climbing to the summit, 
you know, and the view he was experiencing around, I, I completely knew for that time. So they, we were, I mean, humans were not used to climb mountains. There were no real practical reasons for doing so, only the discovery of the geography. He was like thinking that was not, cap not capable only to describe the experience, but also to describe the geological formations and the structure of the, Al of the Alps themselves. And he suggested, and he, he uh, with one, of, one, of friend, one friend of his that was an alpinism, uh, alpinist as well, he published in, in 1790 this detailed description of the geological strata and the positioning of the peaks that were unknown at that time. So most of the records of the Alps were like partial because there was not a, a, a possibility of recording, you know, the, the complete structure and, and positioning of the peaks at that time. He was describing it through this anamorphic view, you know, that was containing not only the experience but only the scientific record and for the first time the geological structure of the mountain range. But these cartographies and representation of mountain ranges arrived thanks to new tools of techniques that also one big influence on the, on the uh, thinking of, of Hino de los Rios, uh, the, uh, the landscape uh, painter and the geographer Franz Schroeder was developing. He, he invented a marvelous, a marvelous technique, a, a, a machine that was capable to translate the movement of the eye while you were looking at the landscape and translated it directly in a drawing. He just took a, a telescope he attached to it a pencil. He made a 30 centimeters diameter paper and magically, literally, the movement of the eye was drawn in a paper. Being capable to record these uh, scenarios of mountains around himself, literally, almost magically translating the movement of the eye into drawings. But also, there was a scientific and geographical understanding of those drawings that were capable through very simple operations tra being translated there uh, afterwards into the you know, orthographic projections, the, the plans, the maps, with very simple means, directly connecting points one another by doing different orographs in different points of the mountain range. So we were fascinated by this discovery, you know, of how representation could be not only a tool to present again things, to understand things, but also somehow in the work also of Alexander van Humboldt, they were reclaiming its own uh, reality as, as possible things. I think uh, Humboldt introduced this wonderful, uh, for us, a, a <coughs> comparisons bringing different things into the drawing, not necessarily being linked in time and space, and start to relate one another to discovery, the interrelationships that happen within mountain range, the um, climate, the natural species, to start founding you know, a new proto-science that was ecology, the system or the study of the interrelationship between different events within nature. Basically, the discovery was happening within the drawings, where empirical data were brought into the space of the paper and start constructing interrelationships. Again, the discoveries were not previous to the drawing themselves and the act of making those graphs, but they were happening within them. So that he uh, started to create this uh, strange uh, world, worlds, microcosms in, in themselves that were reclaiming the, their own right of being um, um, somehow considered entities, real entities in themselves. And we suddenly, we realized that architecture could be approached in a similar way, it's not the same, but in a similar mm -hmm. way, through this expanded notion of context, forming of mic a, mi a microcosms a microcosm, sorry, of expanded connection, somehow critically discussing also the autonomy of, of the object, of the architectural object, form and languages in architectural design. Constructing, you know, buildings as definition of a small um, um, 
a network of links with many other things through uh, uh, affinities and affections. So somehow this was the record of our small discovery. While looking at the, those representations, we realized that architecture could be a repository of conscious connections with many other identities that would become a, the record of, a, of an understanding of the world around. So now a fast visit to a, another uh, of our projects that is still under evolution. And in this coming project, we were also exploring typological inventions based on clear spatial organization serving as a space for interaction. It is placed in the Herte Valley and is thought to be the place for the celebration of the cherry blossom. Uh, the project, we, what we proposed, uh, it was an assertive building that uses the size and the scale uh, to establish a point of reference as, at the scale of the whole valley. And in this project, what we inverted what we were proposing in Giner de los Rios. Uh, instead of having a garden that is the center of the space, uh, we enclosed the space completely, isolating it from the landscape and selecting carefully the connections with it. The, the aim was to intensify the perception of the landscape by constructing a tiny, completely interiorized uh, haptic dome where the space can be really choreographed, like in a cathedral. But at the same time, the interior space is defined by big holes connected with the exterior in selected ways, like entrances, sunlight, radiations, connections, views. And um, we proposed a, a building that was like a working with a presence, position, volume, and, and material, like a church for pilgrims, a chapel that floats in the landscape. And the entire building is the, the final destination of this pilgrimage. So there are three different ways of entering in the, in the building, three different ramps that are connecting with the interior and an annular, annular foyer. Um, and everything is leading finally to the, this central space uh, that is the end of the pilgrimage. This is the, the concrete ring under construction and the underneath uh, rooms. The ram is consciously something that is totally out of scale, it's, it's a space in itself. This is the foyer of the, in the ground floor and uh, those are the underneath rooms. So the concrete ring is surrounded by a non-structural lower part um, uh, and, and, and still non-structural lower part and an upper metallic shell-like um, structure that is some, somehow functioning as a dome. As Christina explained, the, uh, the process of interiorizing the space was followed by the introduction of these big openings that connect the interior to significant points on, on the landscape. Uh, distorting as well it's uh, the mechanical uh, behavior of the of the dome as you can imagine whenever you are opening holes in a, in a shell like a structure you have a problem so we simply bend the the, the surface the surface sorry towards the interior to both modulate the light coming in and to introduce a stiffness uh, and to and framing the, the views obviously and introducing a stiffness that uh, was re-stabilizing the, beha the structural behavior of the dome and thus deforming the, and transforming the tessellation of the surface uh, with these, these very simple steps. So this, the interior is simply defined by this tessellation. It's a big room understood as a three-dimensional structure of uh, very simple, really simple, interwoven steel plates that ensure a similar behavior of that of, of, of a dome. Basically, as you see, they're like a very simple construction technique based on two mill uh, steel plates connected with a, a rods that all together, joined by simple means, are ensuring you know, the, the, the structural integrity of, of the dome. And it's replicated all these uh, things towards the inside with, a, with this mosaic of rhomboid, of, of rhomboid figures that also serve in a, such a big space and such a volume of, uh, of a space to fine tune the acoustics of, of the place as well. As you see in these images on the, on the upper steel uh, structure and the construction. This was stopped in that moment. They're trying to, to, uh, to again to finish it and will mm. be very soon uh, putting our hands on, on yeah. it. Hopefully less than 20 years this is going to be the 
the next step. So we also firmly believe that there is a certain specific specificity related with architecture given by its materiality and its equilibrium that can be explored playfully. And in this case, what a dome, a, a, an infralight dome could be, can a masonry structure be literally inverted in its mechan mechanical behavior? So this project developed for the School of Architecture in Paris, ESA. The pavilion is a, a we propose a, an infralight building that floats. A small dome that could be reused and kept in a box and that can be in, inflated in accordance with public events. Externally is a large golden dome and internally is a white space that protects the event. So the building uh, floats and is anchored to the wall of the courtyard of the school. It was finally constructed for an exhibition, finally. It was constructed for an exhibition in Tokyo in the Museum of Modern Art uh, to the scale of one to five. And it, we developed uh, the dome following the behavior of masonry structures. This is a model following the, th the theories of Robert Hooke to solve the problems of St. Peter's dome. Uh, but in this case, the dome is shaped playing with physical behavior in the digital realm to, to simulate the process of inflation and, and therefore the actual shape of the piece, digitally reproducing the physical automata by Antonio Gaudi. And also uh, the so-called soft concrete by the Spanish architect Miguel Fisac. So somehow the dome is a real inverted catenary that we developed through series, a series of iterations and the position of the binding points and the seams gave shape to the, to the membrane. To finally have an infralight pavilion that uses pieces of, of Rococo furniture as counterweights and is meant to be a shelter for events and, and a machine for the festive transformations of the school. Uh, coming back to Hiner, <coughs> the structure in there is conceived based on the relationship with the with the cladding and the lattice, but also uh, in relation to how we perceive the structures and understand their their performance, their be their behavior. So basically, there are like a, a very uh, thin uh, steel columns, so they're like a steel plates of uh, two centimeters. Uh, every uh, 180 meters, something like four feet or a bit more, um, that allow us to get rid of any beams uh, on the on the floor slabs, and allow us also to to play with the perception of how this uh, structure works. When whenever you are there, you know nothing seems to be a structure because the plates are so thin that you instantly associate them with the uh, cladding as the substructure of the cladding. So literally, and it's not the first time that uh, somebody asks us where is the structure of this play, those, of this thing. The rooms seem to be held by the thickness contained within uh, the space between the glass and the lattice that you we will be seeing. Literally playing with this notion of, of lightness. The lattice itself acts as a filter between the classrooms and the garden, as a light veil, as a light veil. And the lattice was also the result of uh, perceptual experiments partially based on the work by uh, the guy who produced at the end of the uh, 19th century these amazing drawings that if you can have a look to them would be fantastic. Uh, there is Santiago Ramón y Cajal, that was the, the father of the modern ne ne neurobiology, and he, he received the Nobel Prize, and he was very uh, attached intellectually and, and, and also personally to the institution. He was one of those who were like fostering uh, afterwards the, the main scientific institutions of, of the country. So a, even though most of the physiological principles of a stereoscopic vision were pretty well known at the mid-19th uh, mid, uh, mid, uh, century, uh, Ramón y Cajal started a, a research based on, on physiology on, on a certain thing which is very uh, important in our uh, perception of space, which is the chiasm. This part of the, of the brain, on the bottom of the brain, where our uh, visual uh, fibers crisscrossed. And nobody knew how and why, right? He was embarked in discovering how this uh, crisscrossing of the nerves uh, was like uh, related with uh, the perception of depth. Sorry. Um, so uh, maybe you have played with that thing, you know, of, of having a, th a thing in front of yourself, closing your left eye and looking to your uh, with your right uh, eye and, and the other way around, 
to make things move and disappear because we are having two different dissimilar images being perceived with the same eye. So uh, if, we, if we do so, funny thing is that if we are focusing our, our um, eyes on certain thing, things that are like uh, out of this area and where we are perceiving really uh, very well as a single image things, the rest of, this, of the visual landscape is doubled and we tend to perceive it blurred. This is the basic perception, not of volume, but of depth. That is pretty interesting and comes with uh, Santiago and Ramon y Cajal kind of findings. So we somehow try to make something similar with the, with the lattice. Basically, because of the size of the rooms, because of the distance you're perceiving the lattice, because of the uh, in, um, uh, um, intensity of the light and that is focused obviously in the outdoor space, in the greenery of the garden, whenever you see the lattice, magically tends to disappear, disappears, mm -hmm. in fact. You don't perceive it. It's something similar to a light rain, you know, that you perceive through, you know, the space that you see in it, but in a kind of a strange, blurry way. And we tried as well because they were like partially classrooms are partially uh, spaces for a study, we tried to reproduce this a sense of concentration that, the, the, that a rainy day gives you, you know, whenever you are in interior looking at it. So that's the more or less defect from the outside. It's impossible to be photographed, literally. So it's only related with the perception of both eyes being converging into the garden and having out of you the scope of, of focal images the lattice itself. The cladding is then, a, a, at the same time, a garden facade, a lattice, a, a facade towards the interior, to the classrooms, composed out of three layers of really thin steel bars to be producing this effect, uh, attached um, by brackets among them, whose density is, is, uh, fits according to the sunlight exposure in order to block direct radiation and, to, and, and, and produce the modulation of views, right? So it's very simple, has no frames to be having this effect um, very well done. So it's not, you're not perceiving the frames of the, of the panels, basically. They're really thin, 70 centimeters, a bit more than two feet. So that, you know, the, the, and, and, the, and the layers and the steel bars are, are weld one another to produce rigidity. You see that? And in the corners, they are bent towards the interior to produce this, this clean without any frame. Kind of. The effect, obviously, of the of the lattice is inverted whenever you have light in the interior, so you are capable to see through, even though you know during the light, during the daylight, seems to be impenetrable. Seems to be a solid mass, you know, acting as a background for the garden and reflecting the green, the green and 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 the hmm. and the uh, coral colors of the garden. Hmm. So almost finishing, and the last project uh, that was done in parallel to Giner de los Rios, the notion of vision and, uh, and the percep and perception, as a uh, friend was explaining, was also the main strategy for this project, that is the Archaeological Visitor Center in Clunia, uh, in, in the middle of nowhere in Burgos, that is the entrance of an archaeological site. A Roman and city. And we played with the possibility of literally give shape to things through our eyes and also maintaining an intense relationship with the surrounding landscape, as you can see in this image. And the building is a th just a thick horizontal slab elevated from the ground to cover a set of parallel rooms. And this horizontal landscape uh, that, is, uh, that permits also a panoramic view of the interior as well as the surroundings. And the emptying of a large access, would you mind to? Yeah. Constructs the projection of the view to the landscape, crosses mm -hmm. the rooms from side to side as a visual cone by means of another transverse reinforced concrete bolt that serves as the support for the shield cell beams. In fact, structurally, this is necessary and becomes an outdoor space also oriented to, towards the, the settlement origin of the city. On top is an extension of, of the surrounding landscape and is defined by a set of bolted reinforced concrete shell beams with different widths that go down to the eight of 
uh, the windows and the doors is more or less like this. No? And the bolts are also punctuated by skylights by that intersect in parallel to the flat sides of the, of the cells in order to introduce light in this otherwise very uh, extensive and dark, otherwise dark space. And it's almost imperceptible. In here you can see the existing building that is nothing, nothing to do with us. And that is one, the uh, system. Was this. Our proposal is by reducing the, the height to the minimum uh, dimension, it becomes an abstract line on the hillside mm -hmm. of the city. But also this, uh, this idea of giving shape to the space based on the size of movement and the perceptual experiments uh, comes again with the Institución Libre de Enseñanza. I'm sorry. Hmm. Yeah. Is it moving? Yeah. Let me, because I think uh, that is a pretty important. Yeah, hmm. that's working. So uh, what we did basically is basing the entire thing on the um, what we were like uh, mentioning before, that is the site on vision. So there was the only existing thing of the original garden that was like uh, still remaining in there was a nest path like that was crossing the, the garden. So we took this, uh, this idea and I started to give shape literally to the volumes. And you know, as you see here, a, instead of a, projecting our eyes or thinking of our, uh, our eyes as, 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 as a screens that receive information, we started to understand the eyes as something that could be giving shape, you know, almost carving a space when, while we were walking. So the big diagonals point in the space were created to expand perceptively the garden. And we started literally, as, as the small film shows, to give shape to the, to, the, to the building based on the positioning on the, of the perceiver in every single point throughout the years, path like of the garden. So basically we were capable to, instead of being focused on the building itself in a front of way, so the typical way you encounter in buildings, every time you were looking at it, it tends to be a void in the instead of a building. So the building is never perceived either frontally and is not the main focus of the perception. Every time you try to look at it, it appears to you as fragmented volumes and as a void. Just to finish, and uh, it's very difficult to take pictures of this space, so it's much better to go. If you come to Madrid, let us know. But we are going to enter through this narrow corridor to discover the starting S shape of the interior garden, and then there's the small different pavilions, all the classrooms in the, in the garden, and how the diagonals are open at the end, and how the geometry is totally fragmented. Nowadays, it's not even possible to see this because the, the garden is really having, and it has taken over the whole space, so you can't even see the building. Only at the, in the rear part on top of the auditorium, where you can find the way of entering from, I mean, through this huge staircase. And um, discovering also these inclined surfaces that are not only open to the, to the sky, that also make uh, the garden perceptually larger. And it's like a, they are also like a reflecting the color of the sky, the vegetation, and, and the soil without uh, even details, so extending perceptively the experience. And, so, and somehow the, they are like a drawing uh, a step backwards, reducing the presence of the building. <clears throat> and from outside, the, the building is never perceived. A friend explained it. You never see the building. It's like almost impossible. There's no a place to where you can see a building. So the perception is, is always lateral or in, and physiologically uh, what is really present all the time is the garden from the interior and the exterior. And, and the most important thing maybe to finish and to, to have a kind of conclusion, the building is never the main object as we were explaining. Uh, is not the protagonist, is not to be perceived, it's just, it is to be perceived. Whenever you try to look at it, it tends to disappear, especially in spring and summertime. It refuses to be seen and perceived as a whole, and is, uh, 
our rain or your rain reconstruct the building while you are working in walking inside and now coming back to the time and to conclude and close we will close the lecture today with so by, by saying that um, by spending time with the descriptions of the world around uh, the, these these marvelous charts and drawings that we we love despite uh, you know the there was a long time they were produced uh, we understood that our obsessions with multi-layered uh, reading of architecture and with the project of architecture understood as a form of knowledge, something that allows you to enter in contact with the world and to discover, were in fact an attempt to define a small-scale alternative worlds. Uh, through construct, or in other words, constructing cosmographies, self-contained microcosms that could reflect a particular understanding of the world around and could establish affective relations with objects, subjects, and natures but embody them either uh, physically or virtually. And in doing so, and, and, and this, this is the main work that we were doing, these materialized microcosms could provide a small scale alternative to the social and spatial conventional orders. And in the same time that gardens are, in the same way that the gardens and the pavilions and the buildings of the Institución Libre Enseñanza, this foundation, the origin of this project, were doing during 60 years until the arrival of the civil war in, in Spain. Proposing, in other words, alternative notions of beauty based on a direct and deep appreciation and understanding of the world around and this series of links that every single space and individual is having reconstructing and reenacting them, you know, and the bonds with, with all of them in architecture throughout every single decision. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this wonderful lecture. It was um, actually um, a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, it's really an honor to be tonight uh, giving the response for many reasons, not only because I'm a deep admirer, but also I have to understand that the production that Amit Thero has done, um, Amit Thero 9 has done in the last, uh, since the beginning, has influenced the, the, con the contemporary production of architecture in Spain in the last 15 years. You guys define a new ways of understanding things that clearly had an impact on how not only we look at things nowadays, but definitely how we communicate architecture and uh, we represent and build architecture itself. So, so I would like to start um, opening a conversation that maybe we can open to the public later. Uh, actually, I'm gonna quote one of the sentences that you have uh, claimed uh, tonight about the idea of a space. And you said literally, space is a place of intermination, being part of a situation that it's permanently in reconfiguration. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, I, I mean, it's, it's an idea that it's quite clear reading your articles, that the ones that you have published, not only in the last croquis, but actually even in the first ones, in the first croquis mm -hmm. that it was published in 2004, uh, 2004 right? Um, it's this idea that um, architecture has to go beyond the physical traces. So you're clearly blurring the edge between object and subject, kind of uh, embracing the new, this uh, philosophy of uh, the object-oriented uh, anthology, basically, and trying to apply that into architecture. So understanding the complexity of the whole, going beyond what we see, and uh, embracing what we, it's not there. And it, it was not a long time ago that I uh, did an interview for ma the magazine Quaderns to Yoshi Sukamoto, and we were talking about, in that case, about public space. And suddenly, uh, Sukamoto um, defined the public space as something that it was not there, comparing actually Japanese public space with Spanish public space, of course. And he was defining the Japanese public space as something that just emerges with when uh, people actually occupy the space, specifically just in certain types of festivity, festivities like when the cherry blossom, for yes. instance, right? So it's this idea of the space that is not only ephemeral, but it's not, it, it cannot be even um, touched. And it depends differently on who actually does it. 
So this idea of a, of a space that it's uh, changing temporarily and it's temporal changing applied to the, the public, definitely it obliges us to redefine how we actually design public space and how we understand uh, mm -hmm. the public realm. Mm -hmm. so, how, so my question would be how to apply that into into our practices, how to apply that philosophy into how the discipline is being operated, but not only that, into, for instance, how the city is regulated, how architecture is regulated, how to in engage that idea of the unphysical into, into our practices. Big question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... <clears throat> I would say it's something that uh, we discovered throughout this project. I mean, we, today we, we try to, to explain everything throughout one single project because it was the main thing that uh, in, uh, we were doing in, in somehow behind the curtains, you know, within the office, something that was not possible to be expressed and told, and it was permeating throughout all different projects. That's the, the, the first thing. But something that we discovered throughout this project is that we needed to invest a lot of time on understanding realities around us. So it's something. So we were facing a very a, a problem of, of, of many that, that you will find students whenever you will be entering into the practice is how to deal with the situation that you don't know exactly. So that's the, the the first thing that we are encountering. You know, whenever we are like projecting public space, whenever we are talking about it, whenever we are like dealing with uh, certain circumstances related with our work. So you don't know enough. You don't know enough. So it's and the paralysis comes of this. You know, uh, this situation in where you cannot understand things around. So, I would say that one of the things, th the first thing that we practically were trying to set up in within this project, but with several projects, as Christina was explaining, that were like uh, set up by ourselves for ourselves to understand how to deal with these problems methodologically, was methodologies, basically. So, ways of getting in contact with this world or this world around, understanding how, for example, a social group could be a context, was surprising to us. Mm -hmm. For the ones that don't know, um, don't know the, the, this, this place, which is a fundamental in, in the recent history of, of Spain and, and the definition of the national character, uh, you know, people that were studying in that place or the, uh, somehow the schools that were created following the, the, the things were easily uh, somehow detectable. So you, you could tell the people that were educated in that way, right? So you, you, even the, the way they were behaving, the way they were talking, and the way they were approaching reality was clear, right? So how to deal with that? So how to deal with a group of people? How to deal with a common identity? How to, how to respond to that? How can we work with that? So basically, we, we, with our students, we were trying um, in many cases to, you know, to deal with this. Basically, understanding public space, which is one of the most difficult things to be dealing with, you know, because it's dealing with a specific groups of people, but it's also a, having a obviously a generic no, a, a side to it. So, in the tradition of uh, democratic spaces in, in in both Europe and, and US, you know, public spaces need to be generic, open, abstract, and and, and refer to everyone almost in the society or anyone in the society. So it's, there is an inherent uh, difficulty of dealing with these subjects in architecture. So basically, um, we just um, ask our students to deeply study, you know, uh, customs, behaviors, a symbolic way of bringing affections into, you know, physical things for social groups and subcultures. We ask the students to understand, you know, architecture as simply a, a combination of the physical definition of the space and the interactions being happening in, 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 within it. And we simply try to record it. Uh, it's a small attempt, right? I think uh, basically, it's, uh, first of all, by having the interest on that. And secondly, to develop uh, methodologies related with that. It's, uh, it's really interesting how you end up answering uh, my question because definitely, um, actually it was in the first uh, 2004 Corkis when you claim that uh, it was five years, right? Five years of opening after opening your office or it was like six years, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. 
So suddenly you were claiming that your, one of your main goals uh, were to redefine the game. And actually after that, you, you, you published an article about uh, titling the game, right? Mm -hmm. How to redefine uh, the discipline. So the, from the beginning of the, your practice, has, uh, it, there, it has, you have embedded um, a goal of experimentation. And you address that in many ways. The fact that you're always taking risk in materiality, for instance. Most of the materials that you use, uh, you, you, it's really difficult to control their life uh, time. You're, you build with flowers, for instance, right? Or with earth. Uh, it's kind of this uh, type of um, material that you accept from the beginning that it's sensible to change through time in a radical manner. So there's also an acceptance of the failure because of that experimentation from the beginning. Or maybe it's not failure, maybe it's the idea of tem permanent temporality, because also you're always uh, talking about change, even convincing us that y you're not, your building is not there, is invisible. So how to th build things that are there and not there at the same time, that change through time, that are not um, they are so open that you cannot control as the, your garden. Well, in fact, uh, we were trying to explain that. I think uh, uh, <clears throat> it's not only that we love gardens and landscapes, it's that we find that they're like really challenging for architects. Uh, in the sense that <clears throat> whenever you need to face them, so your tools as an architect you know, are like uh, not anymore there. So you don't know how to deal with them. So we can force, you know, nature or landscapes or gardens or, you know, these species to follow us, to follow our, you know, desires, but actually they're not. They totally resist uh, to a conventional architectural practice. So that's why the, uh, both metaphorically, but also in a, in a very straightforward way, the notion of third natures was so important for us because it was like really reconsider what architecture in, 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 in general terms could be nowadays, right? I think, uh, I mean, for us, which is not obviously uh, transmittable to others because it is a personal take on, on third and things and our methodologies also are aimed to be uh, somehow related with our own ambitions and interests and not uh, necessarily for others. But I think that, that that idea is for us is still quite quite important, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, something so challenging, you know, the usual notions of architecture. Something that we we have repeated and we still repeat this the first day uh, in our courses, right? So when we first met together, one of the things that we were like uh, really commenting is that we really like architecture, but we dislike it as well. Mm -hmm. So it was a conflict you know, in this appreciation of uh, constructed environments, because they were not really uh, fine-tuned with uh, contemporary practices, with contemporary worlds, with contemporary somehow takes on certain things, with, you know, things that were happening around us socially and culturally, and the architecture was like anchored somewhere else. But even the most advanced, I'm not even referring to the most conventional or yeah, historical yeah. based ones. Coming back 20 years ago, because our first article in Quadens, it was in Quadens, happily. Oh. Manuel Gausa, uh, well, the second one, in fact. The second one was about that, it was about time in architecture. In, in that moment, maybe like, a, of course, a, if you don't know him, for sure you know him, but of course, Cedric Price was the one really putting this thing on the table and saying architecture and time, what, what the hell? I mean, architecture can die, architecture is, is dirty, Do, you don't have to have architecture forever. In that moment, in that, in, a, in that article, we were already dealing with that fact that, that it's not that important, the materiality, or it's not that important that it's going to live forever. That's 20 years ago, but then, a lot. <laughs> There's also, I mean, before opening to the public, I'm gonna throw the last uh, question that is more a gossipy thing than anything. <laughs> Quite curious, because there's also this obsession from you guys from to, to refer your work to, to references that they're always uh, older than 20th century. 
So you're always referring to works of the 15, 16, 17, and most of them, it's not always, but yeah, yeah, most yeah. of the time, and most of them are always related with, actually it's not architectural history, they're basically a collection of, uh, of cases of uh, scientific discoveries that at a certain moment change the perception. Mm, of perception. Yeah, yeah. So you actually go to history, but not to architecture, most of the time, well, not to architectural history, but other mm. science. Uh, is um, is it a conscious decision? Are you aware of that? Yeah. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> so <Yeah>. why? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the, uh, the why is quite simple. <clears throat> and, uh, we said at the very beginning of, of our talk that um, basically we are not discriminating a long time. You know, first of all, you have a better perspective of other findings whenever you have a certain time, you know, in front of yourself. And I think uh, the preoccupations, the way of approaching things, the discoveries, you know, something fascinating for us was to discover them, you know. I mean, throughout uh, this very simple thing, which is, you know, looking at how depth is perceived in humans, and to discover that was someone with a microscope and with a ink and, and a pen, you know. Try, I mean, really discovering that, simply, is like, yeah, we can have many uh, advanced tools. But at the same time, the problems and the discoveries are quite similar. The situations are completely different. And they're like uh, enlightening the contemporary condition in ways that we are like fascinated by. So it's not that we are nostalgic, that maybe we are, you know, a bit. No, no, I didn't mention nostalgia. No, 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 it's, I'm, I'm mentioning it. So it's not, uh, um, but, uh, but, I, but I think that, uh, I mean, th those findings are still relevant. In, in, in marvelous ways, you know, you look at these Saucer's drawings and the invention of the yeah. orograph, oh. and you're like, hey guys, a piece of paper, a telescope, and a pencil. So you draw with your eyes. I mean, you see the things and they look old, they look nostalgic maybe, they look at you like belonging to a different time, and they say, come on, what a discovery. I would like to be the one, you know, that is capable to draw with his eyes. I mean, like, yes, I want, you know, and then, you know, and you see those things are like mind-blowing, uh, small discoveries related with their, 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 their walls. And the fact that, that, I mean, it's not amazing that uh, von Humboldt dis discovered uh, the, um, uh, the pro I mean, the, the beginnings of the ecology by drawings, by taking mountains from here and there and drawing them together in relation with a, with a, with a, sub, with a parameter. It's not that fascinating that he was capable to describe things that we are still amazed by, yeah. okay. but it's simple with drawings that he was not even doing by himself the drawings. Yeah. <laughs> so they are like, a, a, <clears throat> and also because <clears throat> uh, there is a fundamental thing as well in, in, in that, in that um, obsession. There is a, um, of course, having good friends of any epoch, and, you know, everywhere, but also because uh, I think there are like a, a certain contemporary, I mean, a certain obsession on transmission of languages, and also by understanding the mechanisms also in the architect within the architectural realm through which this transmission is, is, is happening. You can literally discriminate and being conscious of what you uh, are dealing with. You know, in terms of material you are referring to. And the, the, the last thing I would like to mention, before, because I'm talking too much, is uh, that we don't look at them as references at all. So they are like uh, really discoveries for us. And that's the fascinating, well, for, for us it's the fascinating thing to be rediscovering these walls and this, this finding, you know, that we still find, think that they're, they're absolutely relevant. Maybe it's time to open to the public uh, if there's any question. Or commentary. Okay. Uh, I see that your drawings are kind of breaking the bonds between the institutional creativity and the professional world. So, do you have a specific kind of like clients you deal with, or how do you approach the clients to make these? come to realization. We are having a specific clients. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we also, as we explained, we, 
a, we set up a, a um, for ourselves certain projects, you know, that there are opportunities for us to discover certain things. It's not that we we somehow reproduce the uh, the overall set of circumstances that deals with the uh, with a, an actual real everyday on the street project. But we are like uh, really investing a lot of time on the office, um, partially and because of our uh, work in the academia. That's the reason why we are we didn't construct that much. Uh, we are setting up these problems for ourselves as well. I don't know. I mean, the drones are a, a, a still an amazing tool for us. I mean, we most of the things that you saw uh, are part of maybe of a four year five years kind of um, work in the sense that most of the drones have, were produced in that moment. But we were like trying many, many other things. In fact, most of the, uh, most of the drawings that we produce for this uh, building have been never been reproduced. They're really important for us. We are waiting for a really special occasion because there were like certain findings in the representational tools in here because as we were explaining, there were certain moments in where we couldn't literally draw. So, for example, there was not a machine that was uh, capable to uh, simulate the entire set of rods that we put in there. Just so, I mean, just to refer to something, we couldn't uh, test properly throughout the tools that, that, were, that were on the market, you know, the visibility and the effects that we wanted to recreate. So we, and we, we couldn't uh, as well, test what was the the actual size of the of the of the sensation, the feeling of the size of the garden itself. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, when the client, when we finally constructed the thing, and they ask us literally, "But did you know that this was like this? Did you test that?" And we said, "Yes." <laughs> yeah, but we needed to invent new ways of representing things. Something that it's, it's true that this happened, and also maybe we are a bit mad or crazy, but we still believe we end up talking about Humboldt almost in every lecture. But we still believe in the fact that if we are able to invent our way of looking around and, and, and doing that drawings, we can discover things. And as he did, we are crazy. I mean, there's, there's kind of a maybe not market outside for us, no clients asking us for that. If you find okay. someone, you are going to be very lucky. But we still believe in that as a, as a tool of knowledge. And you have to. I mean, you are super young and, and you have to try. You have many possibilities with the new softwares and, and, and all the possible uh, ways of addressing a question, not only our hands, so, but it's not going to be for you to be super rich anyway. <laughs> maybe yes. Or maybe yes, yeah. <laughs> Definitely to, uh, to accept this idea of the unexpected as a, as a part of the design process, hmm. or to embrace it to a point that it has to be, like it seems the only way, you know, like, let's embrace it. Hmm. There, there's another question. Hi, um, thank you so much for the uh, lecture. I kind of am really impressed by how somehow your process is very empirical, just like your references. It's very uh, scientific almost, very steadfast, but always the result is unpredictable and wild. And I'm kind of getting suspicious about how unpredictable your results are because you said you're creating environments, almost creating worlds with your projects like you're mm. opening these small openings for the plants to grow. It's almost like a, like a god complex of controlling every little thing but making it look even random in the end. And I'm kind of curious if, if that's how you see the expression of your ideas, your creativity, your stamp as an architect in the project. And another part of the question is, has there even been a project where you actually failed in accomplishing what you wanted or what you planned or creating the environment that you wanted to create? Uh, we, uh, all of them, <coughs> hopefully, in the sense that, uh, you know, the, the, the projects are uh, in, in the account of failures, in a way. So I can, we, we could have been made 
a, a different talk talking about the failures of this place. The literal. That is a good lecture. That's a good, a good one. <laughs> good <lecture. laughs> and uh, are as fascinating as the as the possible success. Are, you know. Yeah, we are having. Um, um, so our brain, as most of the humans, are divided into parts. In our case, uh, one is specialized on the unpredictable, and the other part is obsessed with the control. So, you know, as the as the visual images are, are they are produced, you know, in bouncing between both hemispheres of our brain, the projects are like produced bouncing between these two realms okay. like crazily. You it's know, actually it's like, as, as the garden, right? The garden, as you said, you establish certain rules in order to allow the battle. Otherwise, otherwise, that battle between species wouldn't have uh, place without you setting specific. Species, therefore, there is a control for that to happen. One of the marvelous things of, of working with others, um, you know, that we are obviously this is not our thing. You know, it's, a, it's something that is being shared with many others through the work as well, through the opinions and many things. But specifically about the garden, um, well, is well, we invested most of the time, or most of the money we had for the for the garden in creating a soil, the soil the nutrients of the soil. So we, we did something, was our client was looking at us. Only Teresa Ali, uh, the, the person who was collaborating with us, the landscape architect uh, from Barcelona, was convincing the client. We couldn't, but she was uh, capable to convince the client that uh, we spent most of the time on creating one and a half uh, um, meters thick uh, uh, soil that was like uh, having all the marvelous nutrients you could have and was porous and perfect to, to allow this craziness to happen. Right? Mm -hmm. So the, the work was like mainly, you know, really producing this soil condition for this and the irrigation system for this thing to be, you know, blasting. Maybe a last question. Well, we have to maybe, yeah, okay, those two. No, no, we're going to do two. We're close. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> one thing I latched on to from your lecture was when you said um, the two of you kind of came together for your mutual admiration and hate for architecture. Um, and I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that a little more. Um, is it something like because of the way that you learn architecture and are fascinated by it in academia, but then you go out and practice and it's totally different, or is it something else? Or mm -hmm. hmm. You mean when we were describing that uh, we are two working together and how we made the decision of is that your question? I mean, the, the first thing is that we are totally different, and when we first met and we started to do, comp I mean, we, we started with just competitions, to get to an agreement was impossible. And, and we have a lot of character. I mean, we are Spanish, with the, like, the blood is like brr, crazy. So it was very difficult. So we started to establish rules to work together. So that, that was the starting point. I remember the first months were like pff, battles. So you need to have a system of rules and Not to agree. Ones, yeah? No. <laughs> so no. Yeah, but, no. but I think uh, it's, uh, well, in our case, it was a, as well a discovery, right? Because the difficulty of working together was also discovering that we needed to simulate in our small environment uh, things that were happening afterwards with clients, with realities, with people using the buildings and so on. So suddenly we said, oh, this difficulty is not that bad. Let's try to set up a method or a way of dealing with this situation of needing to work together. So in fact, I don't think I will be, I could have been able to do what we did together. And I think none of us will, could have been doing that in the sense that it could be completely different things, you know, for sure. And I think that, that negotiation that was happening, you know, at the very beginning among ourselves is a way of, uh, in a laboratory reproducing um, um, situations and, um, and circumstances you will be facing, 
being an architect, right? And then I think that is a fascinating thing of, of being or having many subjects within the work, not only ourselves, people in the office, collaborating with others, and so on, is the, the best way of reproducing a world within a world, and a world of, of different subjectivities within the office. So we are those that are like uh, constantly, not asking, but uh, stimulating you know, opinions about what we were working because I think as many subjectivities you have uh, within the process, um, um, the richer the thing is, you know, is something similar to the creation of these links we were talking today about. Um, thank you so much for the lecture. I was really fascinated by the, by the title of the lecture, which was Alternative Notions of Beauty. But um, I'm just wondering, what does beauty then mean for you in your work? And what is that um, kind of alternative notion? Hmm. Does it mean that you're th thinking about beauty not in terms of like an aesthetic or a quantity or, or it's a kind good of question. Really interesting? And, and difficult to answer. And I would like to refer to also historical terms in the, in the sense that <clears throat> Um, there are certain ideals that are capturing um, 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 historical times and are capturing a, a particular way of looking at the world, understanding it, appreciating it, and, and, and dealing with its transformation. Right? And uh, if you ask me for a definition of beauty, which is, yeah, no, 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 I, I know, I know, I'm, 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 you know, reversing the question. Um, I would say there is something under construction, something that we do think that mm, us, in the sense of, of a big us, in, in the sense of, of, com of different communities that are sharing a common identity, is recreating and reenacting that thing to be constructed that is beauty. And uh, I'm, I'm not a philosopher at all. I'm not someone into aesthetics as, as a philosophical problem. But I think in everyday basis, what we found fascinating when we found this problem of, of a particular group of people that were like even dressing differently, it, I'm, I'm, I'm correct, but acting differently, having a different appreciation of the world, wanting to educate their children in a very specific way, um, you know, all of those things that were involved in, 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 in this institution, we realized that was like a fantastic thing to also <clears throat> be dealing with in, in, in architecture. So we do believe that in architecture languages are always under construction somehow, that need to be referred to our social constructs necessarily, that need to be, uh, need to deal with the way we construct um, a collective subjectivities necessarily. So second thing that we were discussing when we first met is that uh, uh, we dislike architecture because many times we're like either um, uh, the, ref the reflection or the, the, the translation into architectural languages of an epoch, of a single way of understanding an epoch, or the subjectivity of the architect. And it was, for us, frustrating. So, so if you want to wear a Thahadid building, so to speak, I mean, Please don't don't take uh, my reference uh, about Saha in a bad way, but I mean we we totally disagree with that. Totally disagree with uh, architecture as, as a as a as a ground for um, the architect's subjectivity, you know, uh, projection. Totally. Mm. Uh, I think it's good way to end to understand language is something that is in permanent uh, redefinition and it then, then therefore depends on us. So thank you very much, uh, Christina and Efren, for such a good lecture and for everyone to join, have joined us uh, here. Um, thank you.